are all unique and have our own personal story. So dive in with me and let's get to know some extraordinary people. On this week's episode, I sit down with Rich Strumpler. We talk about music, travel, and his amazing career in the U.S. Navy. Okay, we are here with Rich Strumpler. Are you ready to dive in? I think so. Okay, I'm going to ask you a random question. Okay. What has been your favorite concert you've ever attended? My favorite concert, oh, I think it, it would have to be Elvis. Elvis in 1970, it was at the Houston Livestock and Rodeo Show, and he was the entertainment there. And uh, uh, 1970, my wife was about five months, four months pregnant, and you would have thought she had just gotten out of high school. And uh, But, I mean, he it, it was a great show. It was when Elvis was at his prime, so he looked really good. And the great thing about seeing an entertainer live is not the music. If you want to hear the music, you know, buy the CD. You know, that's when you're going to hear the music. But if you want to see what the entertainer is really like, go to a concert, see what they do between songs. And Elvis was fantastic. He was so personable so engaging with the audience and it was just it was just a great experience oh that's awesome so i had to ask you that because how i met you rich was at the garth brooks concert we were in the universe or it will now it's the state farm stadium right state we're, farm right i think yes where the uh-huh. cardinals play what did they say like seventy thousand people there 75,000. it was a sold out uh it was sold out uh stadium yeah yeah so 75,000 people, a full stadium, and we happened to sit right, my husband and I sat right next to you and your wife. And we just started, we just were able to strike up a conversation. And I was just, my husband too, we were just so drawn in by your stories. And you were, you and your wife were so nice and such great conversationalists. And so we ended up hearing a ton of stories, which I'm going to you know, I want you to share here, but I just had to ask you to come on my (laughs) podcast. Did you think I was a little crazy? Oh, no, no, no. (laughs) Listen, you're talking to the king of crazy right here. Uh, When my my daughter uh, found out about it, uh, I guess uh, my daughter and you have a mutual friend Mm -hmm. and... And, and your the mutual friend was telling her about, yeah, your dad was telling all these stories and my daughter kind of rolled her eyes and yeah, yeah, that's my dad, go figure. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not bashful. I like people, I like to get to know people and I, I can talk to anybody. I just love it. Well, that is such a gift. It is such a gift, but you've lived a very incredible life just from what I know of you and just in talking to you for like an hour before the Garth Brooks concert started, but your stories were just so fascinating. And so I want to hear your story. <laughs> well, I, I have to say that I'm, I'm, I'll be 72 years old next month. And in those 72 years, I have been blessed. I look back at the things that I have been able to do places I've been, things I've seen, experiences I've had, uh, many people just, just they, they can't even dream of having done those things. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have done a lot more than me, but I will tell you, I, I look back on my life, and, and my life is full, and, and it's not over yet. No, it's not full. No, you're still young. No, maybe three-quarters full. <laughs> uh, but uh, just always always looking for the new adventure, the latest adventure, see what else we can do that's, uh, that's different. So what has been probably one of your greatest adventures to date? And I know that's a hard question because there's so many, I would imagine. Well, probably the probably the greatest adventure, and my kids still talk about it today, that um, we were living in Japan. I was a naval officer stationed at the uh, uh, Naval Hospital at Yokosuka, Japan, and we went on vacation one summer to Thailand. And our vacation consisted of me having tickets to Bangkok from Tokyo and back. 
Nothing else was arranged. We didn't even have a hotel in Bangkok. We got to Bangkok about 11 o'clock at night and found a hotel. There were, there were all kinds of hotel vendors around there, you know, come stay at our hotel. We found one that we thought looked, looked clean, safe, and not crazy expensive. We jumped in two cabs and off we went, checked into the hotel, they wanted to know if we wanted a tour, and uh, they wanted to sell us a whole block of tours. And I said, no, no, i tell you what, we'll do one tour with you tomorrow, and if we like that, then we'll continue going with you. The next morning, we were met by a, a young lady in a van with a driver, and then we saw Bangkok and saw all of Bangkok, and that was fantastic. Uh, we went to the beach. We went parasailing. Uh, we saw... We saw elephant shows and snake shows and uh, if we have time I'll tell you a story about the snake show but we do I'd love to hear it well the snake show uh, Bangkok is known for being uh, where a majority of the anti-venom uh, vaccines are made for people who get snake bit because of the poisonous snakes that are in Southeast Asia so we go to this snake show and there is a uh, it's a concrete uh, pad, circular pad, of which then there are concrete steps that go up, kind of like an amphitheater. And so we go in there and sit. Now, my wife and my two daughters, they sit in the back. My son and I, we go up front. We want to get the good seats. So Do you mind me asking how old your kids are at this point? At this point, uh, 21, 18, and 15. Okay. My wife will probably correct that, but I think that's <laughs> about right. Roughly, okay. Um, so you and your son want to go up front. So we're up front because we want to see the show. Um, a little a young Thai man comes out, and out of a bag he pulls out a snake. The snake has got to be five foot long, and he is swinging it around by the tail, oh. kind of like it's a rope. And he's talking about all the different kinds of poisonous snakes that are in Thailand and, and all the different kinds of things they can do to you and that. And then he lays this snake down on this pad and he's got a, a long stick with a hook on the end of it. And he proceeds to just kind of pull it around and talk some more. And we're like, okay, this is cool. Well, then the snake, he starts kind of taunting it a little bit, like tapping it on its nose. And the next thing I know, this snake raises up and spreads its hood. And for the first time, we realized this was a king cobra. And this king cobra, well, let's just say there was nothing between us and the snake, but about maybe 10 foot of air. And that seemed like a really bad idea and decided that the better part of valor, valor was to be back where wife and daughters were so we <laughs> zip back there and, and watch the rest of the show from there so then we go from uh we go from bangkok and we go up to chiang mai uh, which is in northern thailand and again we kind of just found us a hotel and then uh i go out the next morning and i said well um we wanted to go jungle trekking so i found an outfitter and they picked us up the next morning and off we went out into the jungles of Thailand, hiking through the hills. Uh, it was hot. It was muddy. It was, the first day was not fun. But the next morning, we are met by our, our guide. Oh, and we spent the night in, in um, I'm not sure if the term is correct. I know that what they call them in the Philippines. It's like a nipa hut. It's a bamboo hut with, uh, you know, a, a bamboo uh, or a prawn, uh, palm frond roof. We slept on rough roven mats with our rucksacks as pillows. I mean, very, very, very rustic. Well, they met us the next morning with elephants. And we climb onto the back of these elephants. Uh, our kids on one and my wife and I on the other. And off we go through the jungles of Thailand on the backs of these elephants. Now, we knew we would ride elephants, but I assumed it would be across like the equivalent to a savanna, a flat area. No, we were taking these through the hills. And as we're riding them, I'm looking down and saying, if this elephant slips, 
they will never find our bleached out bodies because other than our tour guide, nobody really knows where we are. But it was a fantastic experience. So we spend the night again, similar rustic uh, environment, and now we're going to go raft down the Chiang Mai River. And we assumed that this would be, you know, U.S. Coast Guard approved rubber raft or something like that. No, we get to the edge of the water and there are two young Thai boys lashing together probably 15, 20 foot long bamboo poles making up the raft as we're standing there. So it's like, okay, you know, in for, in for a nickel, in for a dime, you know, whatever that saying is. But we said, okay. So they took our rucksacks and anything that we didn't want to get wet. And we climb up on these rafts uh, and two different rafts. And off we head down the Chiang Mai River with this uh, Thai uh, boy on each raft pulling us as we go down the river. Now it's monsoon season. So it rains really hard at night and the, and the river was really flowing. And we're going down, and it's just a kind of a float, but all of a sudden we, we hear this rumbling noise in the distance, and it's like, now that's not a good sound. And the uh, the guides kind of pull the rafts over, and one of them looks ahead, and he said, oh, yeah, there's a, a tree that has washed from the, bra the bank and is now in the river about halfway across, and the water's just boiling over it and around it. He said, well, we think you all probably should walk around and we'll bring the rafts through and meet you on the other side. So one of the guys went with us. We went ashore. And now here we are, bathing suit, T-shirt, barefoot. My daughter, my oldest daughter, was the only one who had enough sense to have shoes with her. Uh, but uh, we were warned, be careful of the snakes. Uh. Though we didn't see any. <clears throat> but then we reach a point where we have to cross a little tributary that goes into the Chiang Mai River. And he said, well, we just need to wait across here. So my wife, my two daughters, the guide, and then my son and I kind of in that order start across this little tributary. And we get about into the middle of it. And the guide turns to me and he says, oh, you should warn your wife and daughter about leeches. Oh, jeez. And I looked at him <laughs> and I said, Unless you want to see my <laughs> wife and my wa my daughters walk on top of the water, <laughs> let's not say anything about the leeches until we get out of the water. I would imagine that was a smart move. Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> got on the other side, and my son and I are kind of eyeballing them as they turn around, just not saying anything, and like, no, I, I think we're okay here. But anyway, yeah. so uh, that uh, that is a vacation that oh, what uh, an experience. my kids still tell stories to their kids about. And it was just, yeah, the, the great uh, Thailand vacation. Wow, that's amazing. So snakes are my biggest fear more than anything. That is my biggest fear. They creep me out. I had a teacher in the fifth grade that had a snake in our classroom in a cage, obviously, and he made me sit by it. And it was just the worst punishment. <laughs> yeah. I think at one point my mommy and dad even like, because it just like freaked me out. I hated it. Even said, okay, it's time to move her. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't my favorite teacher. But then elephants, they're my favorite animal. Uh, I mean, so what a cool experience. The the elephants were, were fantastic. There, there was one point as we were going through the mountains where uh, my son was on a smaller elephant and the elephant turned off the main path that we were on and kind of decided to go his own way. So the, uh, the elephant handler runs over there real quick, gets in front of the elephant and holds up. It's, it was probably 18 inch knife machete right in front of the elephant's eyes where the eye elephant could see it. Mm. And the next thing I know, the elephant kind of goes up and does it. 180 degree turn and is back on back track. on track and wow. we all just kind of looked at each other and say i have no idea what he's done to that elephant with that knife but whatever it was it made an impression yeah he knew he knew oh what but, an experience uh, and the elephants were so sure-footed i was amazed uh how sure-footed they were because this was a, a just a narrow narrow uh, hillside trail that uh, couldn't have been more than maybe three foot wide. 
and they were just uh, they were just extremely sure-footed. That really surprised me. Oh, so, what took you to Japan? Well, we went there the first time. We've actually been in Japan now three different times. The first time we went there, I was uh, an officer in the United States Navy in the Medical Service Corps. And I was stationed at the uh, Naval Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan, which is just uh, south of Tokyo. And I was there to run the laboratory in the hospital. So, and that, uh, we were originally assigned for three years and we extended, we loved it there so much, we extended for uh, another year. Then I retired from the Navy in 93. We came back to the States. I retired from the Navy and... Uh, I had started doing some consulting work with a friend of mine that had started a company in Japan doing medical consulting. And so for about the next seven years, I was flying to Japan two, three times a year, spending three, four days there working as a consultant. Finally, the last couple of years, every time I'd go, he'd ask me, when are you going to join us full time? When are you going to come over? Uh, end of 1999 the laboratory that i was working at and we were living in salt lake city at that time or working in salt lake uh, the the lab just circumstances changed and so i said okay tell me what you got to offer so in 2000 we moved to tokyo and worked there for another three years did you feel like you were going home in a sense after living there for the four years? I I did. I it, it was not it was not scary at all. It was you know we knew where we were. We were totally familiar with the area, how to get around, and things like that. Because when we were there with the Navy, we traveled a lot in Japan. We good we for took you. Advantage, you took advantage. That's took awesome. advantage of the situation there and just did all kinds of just fun things. We we did a, a ton of skiing there. They have some amazing ski resorts. Uh, my my daughters were both involved in modeling while they were there because the Japanese were always looking for, they called them guy jeans, foreigners, uh, to do different things. I ended up getting a bit part in what that year was the number one uh, Japanese movie in Japan. It was a surfer movie, and I played a drunk sailor on Liberty. No uh, way. What's the name of the movie? It was called Inamura Jane. And, uh, yeah, it was about some Japanese surfers, old surfers, who were trying to relive their glory days when a, a, a rare wave form came through Japan. And... Yeah, it was just kind of a silly movie, but uh, it was the <laughs> top grossing movie in Japan that year. And I got a lot of street credit after that when I'd tell people, yeah, I was in <laughs> Inamura Jane. And then I did a couple of made-for-TV movies, and uh, actually with a young uh, Japanese uh, star that uh, went on to become, over the next several years, became incredibly popular and famous over there. And I would... Uh, I would tell people that, yeah, oh no, I did, uh, I did a movie with Nakayama Miho, and they would just like, you're kidding, and they, they would just, you know, that would be like saying I did a movie with, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think like now. Zac Efron or something, just like a young, right, yeah, Zac popular, Efron, only uh, probably more popular, well, a female version of, yeah. So, oh, it was a female. Yeah, this was oh, a female. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Nakayama wow. Miho was a. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, a Mikiko Noda. Okay, Nakayama Miho. Okay. I, did a, I did a music video with Mikiko Noda. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'd tell people that I did a movie with her, and man, that was just well, like... Huge. Yeah, I was, that was huge on that. So, so did you act before, or did this just something you just kind of fell into in Japan? <laughs> when I was in college, I was probably the only student at the University of Houston who was a chemistry biology major and a drama mi minor. So I did theater the whole time that I was an undergraduate student uh, in, uh, in college at University of Houston. So when this opportunity came up, it was like, of course. Yeah, yes, you got this. You, yeah, that's no problem. How fun. That is so fun. So then, we, uh, then the third time we went back, and that was two and a half years ago, we had an opportunity to go serve as military uh, relations representatives for our church, and we were assigned specifically to the Marine Corps Air Station in Iwakuni, Japan, which is just south 
of Hiroshima, about 45 miles. And so we spent another year and a half working on base with like the American Red Cross, Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, uh, USO, and just as, as volunteers, just doing just whatever they wanted us to do. So that yeah, was, uh, was good fun. So Japan is pretty much a second home for you. Well, we spent eight and a half years there. So, so yeah, we have just uh, a great love for Japan and the Japanese people, the food, the culture. Uh, and I will tell you this, you will never go to a safer place on this earth than Japan. Uh, they, I mean, of course, every place has crime, but it's just amazing how safe and how honest and how responsible uh, the Japanese people are. Oh, uh, that's awesome. We, we could learn a lot from them. Yeah. Wonderful. So how long were you in the, the Navy? I spent uh, 21 and a half years uh, in the Navy. And uh, like I say, I was in the medical service course, so in the... Um, I was I was fortunate because uh, my job in the Navy was just exactly what I would be doing as if I were a civilian uh, in running uh, clinical laboratories and forensic toxicology laboratories. And uh, so uh, the only time I spent at sea was uh, times that I actually volunteered to go out and uh, just just so I to could experience, experience it. it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what does that look like being a, a t- forensic toxicologists in the Navy? I mean, what types of cases are you working on? What are you, what kinds of things are you dealing with? Okay. Well, um, that's, yeah. I'll give you a I little, know that's a very broad question. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll tell you how I got into it and, and how the Navy got into it. So uh, we had this, this little thing going on in Southeast Asia called Vietnam. And uh, they recognized that there was a real problem that we were sending 18, 19, 20-year-old boys on a 13-month tour to Vietnam, one of the most depressing places you could probably ever want to be at that time, and uh, uh, an abundance of drugs there. And so as an escape or a relief, they were turning to drugs. And so we were sending over these 18, 19-year-old boys and getting back 20 and 21-year-old heroin addicts. Mm. So the, uh, the Navy said, we, we need to do something about this. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is we want to start a program where we can identify these individuals who are experimenting with drugs and get them into a rehab program and get them off drugs before they become full-blown addicts. So that's how the program started. And, and I got involved in it very early on, 75, uh, when the program first started. Worked well for a few years, but really wasn't that successful. And then about 1982, off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida, on an aircraft carrier, there was an, they call them aircraft mishaps. Plane crashed into the mm-hmm. deck. Those ships and those men are trained to be able to handle emergencies like this. But in this particular one, there was a, a high number of casualties. I, I, I'd have to go back and check now, but I want to say it was around 20, uh, which was just unheard of that there would be that many. In doing autopsies on them, they found a significant number of them had high levels of marijuana on board, that is, in their systems. That that was a very common thing, was everybody was, was using marijuana. Uh, with that, the chief of naval operations says, enough's enough. This rehab program is not working, so we're going to put the hammer out. If you have a drug problem, come forward. We will get you into rehab. If you have a drug problem, we're going to find out about it, and then the hammer will be there. It's no longer going to be just an admin thing. And so with that, then they started ramping up the drug testing laboratories to be able to handle, and and everyone started being screened. Uh, The problem is, is the Navy wasn't set up to be able to handle that. And very quickly, the labs got overwhelmed and backed up. And uh, I was sent, because I was one of the few officers at that time that was not in a drug screening lab. I'd gone on to another assignment. I was pulled back into the program and sent to Oakland and then was part of the task force 
that established the first forensic standards for urine drug testing. And uh, that became the standard for the Navy, then became the standard for the Department of Defense, and ultimately became the, uh, the groundwork for the whole federal drug testing program where we their drug uh, testing that's done on uh, truck drivers anybody holding a cdl airline pilots uh, railroads pipelines and that so that's i was kind of on the ground floor when that all began and so that's what i did for almost half of my navy career and because it was forensic that is having legal uh, uh, ramifications then I was called on periodically to go into court and testify uh, about the testing methods that we used, uh, chain of custody issues, and wanting to know, uh, basically, how do we know you didn't make a mistake? What steps do you have in place? And so, oh, in the early days, I would go and testify two hours, three hours, explaining the whole program in great detail to the satisfaction of the of the judge or the members of the court martial board and that so that's kind of that's kind of how I got got involved in that and, and the, the nice thing is when I retired from the navy then the whole uh, federal uh, civilian program was in place and so I was able to move into those same kinds of jobs, running uh, forensic drug testing laboratories in the civilian side. And the only difference between my Navy job and my civilian job is when I got up in the morning, I had to figure out what color clothes I was going to put on for the day. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have your, <laughs> your uniform. Oh, okay, do you mind sharing the story about the poppy seed? Oh, sure, sure. I that's a, that's a, I, I love that because I tried to get people to understand that in the, uh, in the drug testing program, that we were not in the railroading business. We were in the deterrent business. We weren't there to railroad anybody. And I would testify for either the defense or the prosecution. It didn't matter to me because I felt confident in the things we were doing. That's wonderful. So I'm, I'm the executive officer at the Navy Drug Testing Laboratory, Great Lakes, Illinois, just north of Chicago. And I get a phone call one morning from a, uh, a young uh, female sailor going through nuclear power school in Groton, Connecticut. She was going to be working on submarines. They have to have a top-level clearance, which includes being drug screened. She tested positive for the presence of morphine in her urine. And she swore to me that she didn't do drugs. Now, the reason we test for morphine is not that we're looking for really people that are using morphine because morphine is not an abused drug, uh, but it is the metabolite or breakdown product from heroin. So if you're using heroin, you won't, uh, you won't uh, have heroin in your urine, but you'll have the breakdown product, which is morphine. And that's why we test for that. So she said, no, I don't do drugs. I don't know why this is happening. She said, the only thing I can think of is every morning on the way in to the base, there's a bakery where I stop and I get a couple of poppy seed bagels. And I don't do drugs. Well, my first reaction was, yeah, and all of the other 250 people that I've gone to court on say they don't do drugs either, too. So I'm, I'm skeptical. And the literature at that time indicated that that poppy seed bagels could not cause you, or poppy seeds couldn't cause you. Now, understanding that poppy seeds come from the poppy plant, and the poppy plant is where uh, opium comes from, mm -hmm. and opium then is converted to heroin, and also then can also be converted into morphine. So I'm like, hmm. So I thought about that, and I said, well, I'll tell you what. Send me some bagels. She said, I'll, get, I'll do that. I'm happy to do that. Because her career was over. Oh, that's devastating for yeah. her. And uh, if convicted at a court-martial, uh, she could spend, uh, at that time, it was we, they called it 6-6 six, six down and out. Six months confinement at hard labor, reduction to E1 and a dishonorable discharge. So that's a felony conviction. So, uh, so I said, send me some bagels. So... Um, a couple of days later, the bagels arrived, 
And I looked at them, and they were literally black with poppy seeds. I mean, not just the little bit of pop. These were black. And I, they sat on my desk for about half a day, and I'm looking at them, and I'm trying to figure out, what am I going to do here? So well, I know I can test the seeds themselves. But I said, well, you know what? I know I'm drug-free. So I ate to them. <laughs> And then I started collecting every urine specimen uh, that I produced uh, for the next three days. And much to my surprise, I found that I started about day, the end of day one testing positive for the presence of morphine. And this is not a false positive. The testing that we do is quite specific for morphine. So it, this, was, this was true morphine. And I'm like get out of town. <laughs> so then I scraped uh, poppy seeds off the bagels, crushed them up, extracted them, um, science, 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 science in here, insert the magic here, tested it, and found that there were in fact low levels of morphine present in those poppy seeds. And with that, I notified her and I notified her defense attorney and I notified the prosecuting attorney and I said, I will be more than happy if you subpoena me to come out to Groton, Connecticut and testify in her behalf that yes, her explanation for her positive result is a reasonable and likely explanation. Now, part of the problem at that time was we were testing for the presence of morphine at 300 nanograms per milliliter. Now, that's a, an itty bitty bitty and a whole lot of liquid. It's parts per billion. So uh, we're looking at like, if you were, th I'd have to do the math again, but I think it was like, if you were th uh, 35 years old, we're looking for 300 seconds in your life. Wow. But we can test down that low quite accurately. Not, not difficult at all. The, the technology is there. The reason we went down to 300 nanograms is we wanted to be able to test and detect the morphine for as long as possible after the last use. Now, in looking at her data from the testing that she's done, all of her specimens were just barely positive. They were the 3, 400, 500 nanogram. A person using heroin, we would see levels of morphine of 10,000, 20,000, I mean, huge amounts. And uh, so uh, she got off the hook, went on, as far as I know, finished sub school and really didn't have any contact with her beyond that. But in, uh, in uh, 1987, I published my findings in the Journal of Analytical Toxicology and reporting that, yes, in fact, at the current cutoff levels, you could test positive from poppy seeds. As a, as Paul Harvey used to say, and now for the rest of the story, yeah. the program raised the cutoff levels to 2,000 nanograms per milliliter to preclude any issues with poppy seed, bagels, cakes, streusel, that muffins. muffins you, name it. you can't you can't get anything uh, at that high. So um, that was. Um, uh, Andy Warhol once said that everybody gets 15 minutes of fame. That's my 15 minutes of fame. I'm the one that published that. And they even had an episode of Friends, or not Friends, but Seinfeld, where uh, Ellen was about, or Elaine was about to lose her job because she tested positive <laughs> for morphine due to a poppy seed yeah. muffin. So. I even made it onto TV. They didn't give me any credit for it, They though. should have, dang it. <laughs> it should have been a footnote there, at least. <laughs> but, you know, that's so funny because when we were originally talking about this at the Garth Brooks concert, I remember, like, thinking back, you know, going in, you start a new job. You have to get, you know, clear, just cleared for a drug test. I remember hearing that, careful, don't eat the poppy seed muffins, right. don't eat the poppy seed bagel. I mean, I feel like that's pretty common knowledge these days. Well, it is. It is these days. So yeah. you should be proud of yourself. I still, I still hear about it. I still hear about it. But what I hear is, don't eat the poppy seed bagels. Don't eat the poppy seed <laughs> buns. And I say, no, go ahead. It's not going to matter. It because is not. of me, I changed because that rule that. for you guys. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. Now that you mention it. I'm the one that discovered that. So <laughs> that is a big deal. That's yeah. pretty cool. Any other highlights from your career in the Navy? 
Um, I can I can say this. I I spent 21 years in the Navy, and because of that, I have literally friends all over the world. I got to see places and go places again that most people only only dream about and and I guess maybe that's what triggered my wanderlust uh you know for the rest of my life because uh yeah we just traveled and and saw places and and wanted to make sure that every place we went we took advantage of while we were there to see that so while living in Japan the first time we got down to to Thailand, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Australia, uh, the Philippines, Guam, Okinawa, all over the islands of Japan, mainland China. Uh, so, yeah, it was fantastic. Oh, and you haven't slowed down any because you and your wife are still traveling. We're still we're still traveling. We uh, yeah, we've got our passports uh, passports full. That's so fun. Uh, your last trip. Our last trip was in uh, September, and uh, we went to Moscow, uh, flew into Moscow, spent about three days there, and then got on a uh, riverboat cruise and went up the, the Volga River, stopping at little villages all the way to uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, that was uh, about two weeks, and that was just fantastic. Uh, totally changed my impression of the Russian people. Still don't trust the government so much, but the Russian people were so nice and so hospitable, and we just we just loved interacting with them. Uh, Moscow and Saint Petersburg, without a doubt, are the two cleanest cities I have ever seen. Uh, never, I one spot I think in Moscow I saw some graffiti on a wall, but that was it. Everything else and no litter on the side of the road. Uh, just amazingly clean. I I was just, I was I was shocked at how clean it was. And the same thing, St. Petersburg. Oh my gosh, St. Petersburg is such a beautiful city. It's just if you ever get a chance to go, that's yeah. Yeah, I've never been. I'd love to. And then from there we went over to Helsinki, Finland, and spent three days in uh, in Helsinki, and uh, and that just gave us a little bit of flavor of. Uh, of Finland, uh, uh, I had bear for dinner one night. Uh, yeah, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it. It was one of those things. It was different. The, the waiter talked me into it by saying, "When are you going to have a chance to have bear Good again?" Point. And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." And then uh, we went over to uh, Tallinn in Estonia, which is just right across the Gulf of Finland from Helsinki, and uh, that was just, yeah, the total. I think it was about 17 or 18 days, and it was just, just fantastic. Uh, just a great place, and I would recommend that to anyone. How grateful are you that you're married to such a wonderful person and partner that you can go off and have these adventures with? Oh. Someone that's just as engaged and excited and into it as you. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, have, I, I chose well. Um, my wife and I met in high school. We were high school sweethearts. We married when I was in college. We've been married now... Um, 51 years and she I have drug her all over the United States the Far East and and she has been right there by my side just uh, uh, supporting everything I did uh, uh, there were some times in the Navy that it, it was tough even though I wasn't at, uh, on board ship uh, I, I would get sent out uh, on um, what we call t t TAD, temporary additional duty, mm -hmm. where I would have to go off and and while she was t keeping the home fires burning and and making sure our kids grew up to be, we have three children, boy and two girls, and make sure that they grew up to be the wonderful kids that they are. So yeah, no, I I did well. That's wonderful. I thought she was such a delight, such a delight, and what a fun couple you are. <laughs> Thank you. We we like to have fun. We we like to go out and do things and enjoy ourselves and yeah. So you mentioned to me and I can't I believe it was in the 90s you had a bit of a health scare. I did. Uh I did at the uh, uh when I retired from the navy uh, uh I had uh, found out that I had actually hepatitis C. And uh, I I know exactly when I got it. And that was when I was in junior high school. 
Uh, I had uh, a health issue there that I ended up getting uh, transfused with five units of blood. Mm. And I know that's where it happened from because I, I, I was never had any symptoms from it. Uh, but when I was in college and, and going through doing my internship in laboratory uh, medicine, uh, I would test myself and I noticed that my, uh, my liver enzymes, the things that indicate how your liver mm-hmm. is doing, they were always slightly elevated. Nothing, nothing to get panicky about, but always slightly elevated. And it wasn't until I was about ready to retire from the Navy that they actually had identified this thing called hepatitis C. And, uh, and then there just a lot of information out mm-hmm. on it. So, uh, I said, well, you know, I guess we got to do what we got to do. And uh, so I went through uh, six months of, of uh, chemotherapy, uh, antiviral drugs. And uh, uh, if you can, not, not wanting to get maudlin about this, but uh, if you can imagine having the flu for six months, yeah. uh, that's what it felt like. So during that period of time, I was kind of feeling kind of down and... Uh, I started a list of things that I have done. Uh, if you ever want to see, you know, where you stand in life, you know, you take inventory. And yeah. that's what I did. And as I made up that list, I realized that uh, of the things that I've done, the places I've been, I've climbed to the top of Mount Fuji. I've scuba dived on the Great Barrier Reef. I've rafted down the Tully River in Australia. I've been uh, ridden elephants through the jungles of Thailand uh, uh, and that. And so as I went through that list, I went, wow, you know, even if this doesn't work out, you know, you've had a really full life. And from that, I said, you know what? I, I, I started thinking about stories, stories like I've told you uh, that I said, you know, I need to write those down. And so I started writing them down, and uh, the end result was uh, I wrote a book. And it's called Over the Neon Rainbow, An Adventure in Life. And uh, I uh, indicate in the book, during the introduction, I said uh, that uh, these, are, these are stories. They all are 100% true, except maybe where the frailties of memory. Yeah might change things a little bit. Uh, I said, they're not in any particular order, though one story might tend to remind me of another. So sometimes there's a connection there. But, and they're all eh, one, two pages long, almost like little vignettes. And uh, yeah, so I put this together and uh, uh, published it on a, it's a publish on demand thing called blurb.com. And I gave all of my kids uh, copies of it for Christmas and, and, and uh, on to friends. And on the copies that I'd given to my kids, I forgot that I'd done this. Uh, but uh, my, one of my kids reminded me of it and everything. About maybe three quarters of the way through, right close tight to the binding, I put a check in there for $20. That's if so you nice. if you no if you read no, this you far read it, you if you read this it, far you'll price. find exactly you'll find the check and cash the check <laughs> so that was kind of a, a test but uh, anyway so it was it was great fun writing it and uh, and it's been uh, been fun uh, sharing it with my kids and friends and that and what a uh, treasure for your family well family yeah and that's and, and for you and your wife but I love what you said is so you were feeling kind of down. Yeah. So you yeah. you took inventory. You start writing this. Did this just totally change your perspective? Well, it did. It did. It like I say, it made me realize that uh, if things uh, you know if things don't work out, uh, you know you, you you've had a full life too. And as it turned out, temporarily they didn't work out. I I finished the six months. And then about a year later, I was tested again, and my viral loads were back up. Mm. And so I went through a second round, a much more aggressive round uh, of chemotherapy again, and uh, lost a ton of weight and uh, lost, not didn't go bald like like with cancer treatment, but lost a lot of my hair and uh, and again, just the most miserable time I'd, mm. I'd ever spent. And, uh, but, uh, it worked. 
it worked. And uh, now I've, um, the last number of times that I've checked, I'm still, I'm virus free. And, and so by, by definition, uh, I've, I've been cured. And, uh, and I'm grateful, absolutely That's grateful wonderful. for that. During this time, uh, my wife was so, so supportive on this. I mean, we would plan things uh, to go out and do something or something like that. And I would just get up that morning and I'd just say, you know, I just can't do it. I just don't have the energy. And she would like, no problem, no problem. Aww. And, uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, like I say, very, very supportive because I, I don't want to say, you know, I'm not a martyr, I, but I have a high threshold of pain and I'm not one to sit and complain and, and like I, I'd go to work every day because I wasn't going to feel any better if I stayed at home. So I might as well go to work. Yeah. So, uh, but that, but anyway, so that, uh, yeah. And the book was, was good therapy uh for me in doing that and uh like i say the title is over the neon rainbow an adventure in life and i'm about halfway through the sequel to this which is called under the electric moon the adventure continues and i hope to have it finished by the end of this year i love your choice of words in the title neon rainbow electric moon yeah well i am a country western fan as obvious. By... I heard you belt out all those Garth Brooks songs <laughs> at the concert. Oh, I loved, I absolutely loved Garth Brooks. <laughs> oh, I it, loved him. He's yeah. just the best. He was such a fun entertainer, he but it was so was. fun sitting next to you because you could just feel your energy and hear you <laughs> sing. It was awesome. Okay, so I didn't so, mean to interrupt you there. That's all right. So Neon Rainbow, uh, Brooks and Dunn had a song about where they talk about the neon rainbow in there. So that's kind of where that that came uh-huh. from. And then as I was trying to think of a title uh, for the uh, the subsequent book, I thought Electric Moon, Neon Rainbow, Electric Moon. And so this is Over the Neon Rainbow. One of my favorite all-time songs is also Willie Nelson's version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And I also love the mashup by called brother is the hawaiian that does over the oh, rainbow yes. and uh, it's a wonderful uh, wonderful world wonderful world yes yeah i love that so i love that song and so over the neon rainbow seemed seemed to work and then uh, trying to think of the name for the next one and it just i don't know it just popped in under the like if one's over then this one is going to be under and under what under the electric moon it's perfect yeah. it fits so, beautifully yeah the adventure continues that's wonderful so yeah. So the adventure continues for you. You're, you mentioned you're 72. You're young. You're retired. Mm-hmm. You play golf every Tuesday. At Is least, that what it was? Because when I, we were going to schedule this, it was yeah. no question. C- couldn't do it on Tuesdays. <laughs> Tuesday's my golf day with my golf buddies. And then Saturday, I play golf with my grandson. I've got a 16-year-old grandson. And he and I just have just such a great time every Saturday most every Saturday that we can, uh, we get out and, and play golf. And that has been such a blessing being here and having that opportunity mm-hmm. to do that with him. I just love it. It's just so much fun. That's wonderful. So you've mentioned you've lived a very full life. You've had a lot of amazing, amazing experiences, traveled to so many places. What's left on your bucket list? Uh, you know, I, d- I don't know. Um, I've, uh, we're going to Norway in, uh, in June. Going there for the summer solstice, so it's a cruise along the the western coast of of Norway. Never been there, so uh, so we're excited. Uh, we're excited about doing that. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, probably uh, a year from now, uh, turning in our as we say, turning in our papers, our application uh, to become a senior missionary couple again. Uh, doing another, we really like doing the military relations. Uh, we're going to stay stateside this time, uh, but uh, so don't know where that'll be yet. But it'll be one of the military bases here in the United States. We've got a a couple that uh, that we're we're thinking about asking for. We'll have to see if those are even available when we get ready to go out. So that's kind of the next uh, the next big thing, but. Oh, uh, you, know, you know, we just, we just never, never know. I'm, I'm, before I go to Norway, I'm headed down to Florida. I've got a friend of mine that 
bought a uh, 26 foot Ericsson sailboat and uh, didn't know one end of the sailboat from the other. Just <laughs> always wanted to get a sailboat. He bought it, called me up and said, Rich, can you come down here and teach me how to sail? I used to teach sailing when I was in the Navy. I learned to sail when I was uh, stationed in Philadelphia and then uh, sailed quite a bit when I was in Great Lakes uh, to uh, everything from little day sailors to a, a 37-foot yawl. Uh, so it's like, yeah, I can do that. So I made a couple of trips down there. And we just had a ball, showed him how to sail. I'm headed back the 1st of June for about five days. Uh, we're going to go uh, sailing again. And then the end of September, I'm going down there for about eight days. And we're going to try and do some extended sailing. So sail out into the Gulf and uh, not sure where all we're going to go. We haven't figured that out yet. But uh, uh, but just, oh, I love sailing. Get out on the water and the balance between the nature and, and the water, the wind, uh, and no noise other than the the, the water you know, running past the hull. It's just, it's just so... Your own little piece of heaven. Oh, it's so, so therapeutic. Yeah, it absolutely is. How neat. I was telling you, you would get along well with my brother that's a defense attorney, criminal oh. defense attorney. And he, it's something he always wanted to do was to learn how to sail. And he did probably in the last five years or so, he's learned how, and he'll go to San Diego from time to time and just go sailing. And oh, it's yeah. one of his very favorite things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, very therapeutic. What was funny was I had not, I had not been on a sailboat probably in 10 years. And when he called me up, there was this little panic. Now I'm supposed to teach him all the sailing I I've done was, we call it bare bone sailing. So no fancy anything on it, on any of the sailboats. And, uh, He's like, well, I hope I can, I hope I can do this. And so I, I, I went on Amazon and you know, you can buy anything from Amazon. <laughs> yes. And I found a book on, uh, uh, fundamentals of sailing, uh, 26 foot and above for sailboats. And I said, this is perfect. And so I spent about two months just going through that because I wanted to make sure I got the terms right. And I wasn't teaching him any, anything wrong. And, uh, when I got on that sailboat and we hoisted those sails for the first time. It was just like a flood of memories came back of how you set the sails, how you adjust them, how you read the wind and that. And it was, you know, they say it's like, you know, like riding a bicycle. Yeah, I was it, thinking that. It absolutely was. It was just, I... It just all came it back. It just all came back. It was like I had just been sailing yesterday. So that was, that was good fun. How fun. Another question for you while we were waiting for the Garth Brooks concert to start, you talked a lot about many concerts that you'd gone to. And I had asked you who you haven't seen that you would have liked to have seen. And you said the Beatles. Oh, absolutely. Right over there. Yeah, no question. The Beatles. <laughs> I would have, yeah, I would have loved to have seen the Beatles. Uh, and uh, I've seen, uh, uh, there was uh, back in the, um, trying to think when it was, uh, yeah, judge time from where I was living at the time. <laughs> so this was probably uh, mid 80s. There was a show touring the country called Beatlemania. And they had gone out and found four guys that just absolutely looked and sounded like the Beatles. And I went and saw it at a theater in Chicago, and it was fantastic. And at the end of the show, I went, that was great. But it wasn't the Beatles. Oh. It wasn't the Beatles. So that's yeah. That would that would be that would be my my regret. Maybe not a regret, but yeah, I wished I could you have. Wished seen, you could have seen. Them. I wished I could have seen. Yeah. Them. But I've seen so many other people that have just. I saw Yul Brynner in The King and I in Chicago. That's wonderful. I saw Carol Channing play Hello Dolly. Uh, I saw uh, Robert Goulet in Camelot. So, I mean, these are just the, the iconic, the original, the original of, actors. Yeah. yeah. For those kinds of things. So, uh, and I've always, uh, and, and again, my wife has shared that love. We've, we've, we love theater and we love going to theater. And um, I've got two granddaughters that have inherited that from me that are, uh, one just, uh, 
closed uh, uh, the uh, the Little Mermaid. She played Ursula Ooh. in there and was amazing. This was at the Mesa. What a Ar- fun rule! Oh, Mesa Art Center. Here- Oh, okay, I was thinking la- it wasn't last year. No, is this was last week. Oh, okay, oh, yeah, I just last it was week. There, dang it! Yeah, at the Mesa Arts Center. Cool. And what's amazing is these are kids from six, seven years old to sixteen, mm-hmm. and the quality of the of the production was just well, it was just phenomenal. Is this so, the same? Is this the same uh, production company that does the best Christmas pageant ever every year at the Mesa Arts Center? No, no, no it's different. No. Okay. Yeah, but uh, so yeah, my my grandkids, at least two of my granddaughters, have inherited uh, uh, that love of of theater and performing. And uh, uh, I always said when I was a kid, you know, could if you could do anything when you grow up, what would it be? And that would be lead singer in a rock band. It's not too late, Rich. Yeah. Well, I've got my guitar. Uh, I got I got a guitar. I got a banjo. I've got a ukulele. I've got uh, keyboards. None of which I play very well, but it's I, I still have fun. And uh, I even had a name for, for my you. band. Let's hear it. My band. My middle name is Earl, so it was Richie Earl and the Dukes. I like that. It. Was going to be the name of my band, but. <laughs> Richie Earl and the Dukes. Yeah. Hey, it's not too late. No, <laughs> I may be on that one. <laughs> Any other um, singer or band living that you would still like to see? Uh, well, I've, I've seen him twice. I love Willie Nelson. I've seen him twice. I'd go see him again. Uh, I saw Celine Dion and just absolutely we brought this here love just that. For you. <laughs> I saw that sitting there. I I I love I I love uh, yeah Willie. I love Celine Dion. Um, trying to think who Garth was kind of my my big uh, unchecked box. Uh, and when I had a chance to to pick up these tickets, uh, my daughter told me about it from our mutual mm-hmm. friend. And uh, basically, I said, I don't care where they are. As long as I'm inside the stadium, I just, I just want to be able to say the, that I, I went and saw him. Um, I would have liked to have seen uh, Randy Travis uh, before his uh, medical problems. Uh, I just, I, I've always loved his music. Uh, but I love the old singers, too. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I am so glad that you got to go to Garth Brooks because I was able to meet you. Well, and it was yeah. so fun <clears throat> to meet you and your wife. And I've loved hearing these stories. And I am going to read this book. And then I can't wait for your next one. I expect to read the next one. Okay. Then we'll have you back. I just got to get that one back because it's the only <clears throat> oh, copy yeah. I have left. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I trust you. Yeah. I trust you with that. Besides that, I know where you live. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rich, for diving in. This was so much fun, and I wish you luck. Enjoy. Have fun on your adventure in Florida and Norway, and I'm excited to hear all the other places you go. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. This has uh, been a great fun, and uh, uh, as you can probably tell, I, I'm not bashful about things. Uh, uh, someone once told me I went into court, and I, I used to, like I say, testify in court a lot, and one of the prosecutors said, Commander Strumpler, the thing I love about you is I can put in a nickel and I get the whole song. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, that's I know what you're going to ask me, so I just tell the whole story. And I love that. But you have a gift at storytelling, and you have a gift at conversing, because not everybody could get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and much to the chagrin sometimes of my family. <laughs> well, it was fun diving in, and I feel like we've just touched the surface with you. So um, good luck finishing your next book, and we'll have you back. Okay, I'll be happy to come back. All right, thanks for diving in. Jeff, we are done.